great is his mercy. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless the Lord for those of you who are tuning in with us here at our midweek Bible study service hour at 1321 Providence Road in the city of Brandon. New Life Christian Fellowship under the leadership of our beloved pastor, Bishop Dr. L. Register. Amen. We thank and praise God for each of you. Go in and get your place and get your phone and get your tablets and get in that sweet spot wherever you are to tune in and connect in this service hour. Amen. Hallelujah. God is so good. His grace, his grace is sufficient. Tonight's scripture is found in Psalms 34. Amen. And the word of God reads, I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Delivered me from all my troubles. Delivered me from all my concerns. He delivered me. He provided for me. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that we praise you continuously over and over and over again, Lord. Lord, when we can't depend upon man, when we can't trust in, in our family members, we trust in you, God. Hallelujah. We bless you tonight, Lord. We invite your presence to be with us tonight, oh God to saturate us with your word, to revive us, O oh God, to heal, to deliver, O oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank each of you who have come out here on this midweek service to help operate, that we can function and be able to have this service for those of you who are connecting in with us. We thank and praise God for the word that will come forth through the man of God that is already prepared, that it will be divine, and that it would encourage, it would ignite, it would accomplish what he has already said it should do. We thank you and we praise you for this worship hour and this worship experience. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Minister praise Sherwood. your mercy towards me. Your love and kindness towards me. Your tender mercies I see day after day, day, after day. Your tender mercies I see Your loving kindness Your loving kindness Towards me Towards me Your tender mercies Your tender mercies I see I see Day after day Day after day, forever faithful towards me. Towards me, your loving kindness. You're always providing, providing for me. Greatest your mercies, I see. Greatest your grace. Great Towards me, your loving kindness towards me, your tender mercies I see day after day.
mercy. Always provided for me. Great is your mercy. I see. Day after day. Somebody say day after day. Amen. He's, he's that faithful. Make you just want to lift your hands up and say thank you. We're glad you tuned in tonight. Wednesday night, the 4th of January, the first Wednesday night service of the year. Amen. Somebody say increase. Somebody say increase. increase. Amen. Give the praise team a hand. Play so well in saying thank you. I want to read one verse for you tonight. I'm believing that this church exponentially began to grow beyond what we see. Somebody say increase. In order for a church to grow, you got to become you got to become, uh, you know, um, people have to like you. That makes sense. You got to be a people person. If you're a child of God, you got to be a people. You got to be, even if you're not. You got to find a way to become people orientated. You can't be a rattlesnake your whole life. Amen. I just give you, go with me quickly to Matthew 25, starting at verse 14. Thank you, praise team. I'm not praise team. Musicians, man of God, thank you so much. I want to see, I want to show you something. Because the re reality of it is that you, there's no excuse for you not producing. You've got to produce. you got to produce. You can't not not produce. You shouldn't, you shouldn't feel good if you're not replicating. The goal of a believer is to replicate. You got to get people saved. Amen. Not just come to church, but get them saved. Look at the text here. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling in a far country who called his own service and delivered them his goods. Somebody say, I got mine. <laughs> Verse 15. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two to another one, and every man according to his several ability and straightway he took his journey. So see that? God will never give you what you can't handle. If you can't handle something, it's because you went to the store and got it. Not because God gave it to you. God doesn't put on us more than we could bear. Somebody say amen to that. We find ourselves choking in, in, in too much of, of, of something is because we've elected to choose to take some things on that he didn't ask us to do. He says simply, if, if I give you five, it's because you can handle five. He says to another two, to another one, every man or woman according to their ability. Look at verse 16. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. Verse 17. And likewise, he that had received the two, he also gained the other two. Verse 18. Watch the process. He that received the one went, digged in the earth, and hid his Lord's money. Verse 19. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoned with them. Verse 20. And so he had received the five talents, came excited, brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou be delivered unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained besides them five talents more. Somebody said Productivity. The Lord said to him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that received the two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents besides them. Verse 23. And the Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Last person. Watch this. Next verse. Thank you, son. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hand, that, that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sowed, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid. And went and hid. What, a, what an excuse. I was afraid. And I hid the talent in the earth. Lo, there thine 
has that is thine. Look what he says. The Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. Look at the word slothful. Pay attention to that word slothful. He said, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou ought therefore to have put my money to the exchanges, and then at my coming I should have received my own with usury. That's interest. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which had ten talents. Verse 29. What? Unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. Somebody say amen. Somebody say I want to be a people person. Amen. Go be the Matthew 7, verse 12. You're going to be a good people person because you learn how to treat people like you want to be treated. Therefore, all things whatsoever you, you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Give it to me in the, in the uh, message Bible. If you believe in Christ, then you need to be a people's person. Jesus taught us to love one another, John 13, 43. He commands us, call it, to love one another. He said, a new commandment I give unto thee, you love one another. Here is a simple rule of thumb, guide for behavior. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you. Then grab the initiative and do it for them. And add up God's law and prophets, and this is what you get. Somebody say amen. So the question I have to ask myself tonight, what will draw people to me? And there's five things that, that are, are five qualities that are reflected in people that are, that are people persons. Let me tell you that the basis of life is people, how they relate to each other. Our success and fulfillment and happiness depends upon our ability to relate effectively. Somebody say effectively. The best way to become a person that others are drawn to is to develop qualities that people are attracted to. Does that make sense? When special people touch our lives, then suddenly we see how beautiful and wonderful our world can really be. They show us that our special hopes and dreams can take us far by helping us look inward and believe in who we really are. People like that bless us with their love, their joy, through everything they give. When special people touch our lives, they teach us how to live. Somebody say amen. There's a poster in Nordstrom's department store once caught my attention. The only difference between stores is the way they treat customers. That's a bold statement. Most stores would advertise the quality of merchandise or their wide selection is what sets them apart from the rest. The difference between Nordstrom and other stores, according to the employee of the, com of the, of the competition, is that other stores are, are organization oriented. Nordstrom is people-orientated. Somebody say people-orientated. Their employees are trained to respond quickly and kindly to customers' complaints. As a result, according to Nancy Austin, Nordstrom doesn't have customers. It got fans. How many want fans in here? Not customers. Somebody said there's five things, five characteristics that we want to focus on tonight. The golden rule, what the key... What's the key to relating to others? Putting yourself in someone else's place instead of putting them in your place. Did you get that? It's putting, putting yourself in somebody else's place instead of putting you in their place. Christ gave us the perfect rule for establishing quality human relationship. He called it the golden rule. A name it got sometime around the 17th century, near the end of the Sermon on the Mount. In a brief command, Christ taught us to couple taught us a couple of things about developing relationships with others. We need to decide how we want to be treated. I said we need to decide how we want to be treated. Then we need to bring or begin to treat others in that manner. I remember going to a restaurant with my daughter, and there was a, a woman in, in, the, in the restaurant that was really kind of annoying and aggravating. She just was not nice to the customers. So I said to my daughter, I said, watch this. So I said to the lady, I said, could you give me a change for a $100 bill? She said, what? I said, yes, can you give me a change for a $100 bill? Because I want to make sure I leave you a good tip. When I said that, man, she came over there, she got that 100 and changed it. And from that time on until she, we left, she was the nicest person to us and to everybody. You want to know why? I did something that made her change her behavior. I was nice to her. 
How many know you got to be nice to people? Seize that moment. It was a moment I, I was able to seize and change her behavior. So there are five ways we want others to treat us. The five points seem to be simple even to mention. Matter of fact, let me, I wrote something down earlier about listing. Listing is one of the easiest things you'll ever do and one of the hardest. In a sense, listing is easy or hearing is easy. It doesn't demand the initiative and energy required in speaking. That's why faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of God. The point that hearing is easy and faith is not an expression of our activity, but our receiving the activity of another. So when you talk about listening, it means that you have to really spend some time. It goes beyond just hearing. It means that you, you're attentively listening to what the person is saying. So these five characteristics will make us people person. The first thing I want to share with you is that you want to be a person that will encourage others. Or I, let me put another place. You want others to encourage you. Five ways you want others to treat you. Five ways, sir, what you want others to treat you. And one of the first things you want, you want to be encouraged. Somebody say, I want to be encouraged. It's important. Somebody say, it's important. There's no better exercise for strengthening a person's heart than reaching down and lifting people up. Think about it. Most of our best friends are those who encourage us. You don't have, any, you don't have many strong relationships with people who, who put you down. You avoid people and you seek out those who believe in you and lift you up. Look at Hebrews chapter number 10, verse 24 and 25. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. Let us consider one another. You see that? I, I, I want to be around people that consider my feelings. Amen? Amen. Think about that. Isn't that important? Somebody say, my feelings are important. So watch this. The, the first thing is that I, I, want, I want others to encourage me. Five things I said. Five ways you want others to treat you. I want to be encouraged by other people. Somebody say, I want to be encouraged. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. I want to be around people that provoke me to do good. I want to be around people that provoke me to do good to myself and to others, not forsaking the assembling ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much more as you see the day approaching. See that? We want to be around people, Chris, that encourage us. Amen. Several years ago, a man by the name of Dr. Maxwell Marx wrote a book was most popular. There was a wealthy woman that was greatly concerned about her son. She came to Dr. Maltz for advice. She had hoped that the son would assume the family business following the husband's death. But when the son came of age, he refused to assume that responsibility. Instead, he chose to enter another, another profession. Dr. Maltz said he would try to help. So he sat down with the son, and the son explained he would have loved to take over the family's business, but you don't understand the relationship that he had with his father. He was a driven man who came up the hard way. His objective was to teach me self-reliance, but he made a drastic mistake. He tried to teach me that principle in a negative way. He thought the best way to teach me self-reliance was to teach or to never encourage me. In fact, what the father would do is that he would throw him a ball ten times before they would go inside. And the first nine balls he would throw him, he could catch them. It was always the tenth ball. The father would do something with it that the boy would never catch the ball. Isn't that something? The, the boy did everything in his power to catch that 10th ball. And he told Dr. Martz, he said, because of, because of the way his father treated him, you know, you could handle people the wrong way and ruin them forever. You can't handle everybody the same way. Are you listening to me? And because... The, the boy's father tried to treat him like his father treated him. He didn't want to have anything to do with the business. Anybody hear what I'm saying? He didn't want to have anything to do with his father's business. And all he ever thought about was catching that 10th ball. Isn't that something? 
said his father never let him catch it. He said that's why he got to get away from the business. He wanted to still catch that 10th ball. Here's another story. The gray-haired man stands alone. His name was Eugene Lang. He became a successful man. In fact, he was a man of the year in 1986. Standing in the auditorium by himself, distinguished, looking at people that were black, Hispanic, people from all races. And he was at a sixth grade graduation. People were dressed in blue caps and grounds and they were seated in the front seat. This was the first graduation. It was just the perfect time to dream, he says. He's speaking to this class that he used to be in. Now he's a multimillionaire. And he says to these, these kids, dream what you want to be, the kind of life you wish to build, and believe in that dream. Be prepared to work for it. Always remember each dream is important because it's your dream. It is your future. Somebody said, encourage me. It is worth working for. You must study, he continued. You must learn. You must attend junior high school, high school, then college. And you must go on to college, he says. He says, stay in school. He's getting excited. And speaker paused. And he said, he says, suddenly inspired, he blurts out, I'll give each one of you scholarships. For a second, they were silent. Then there was a wave of emotions. Here was somebody that was coming back to his community to give back to people because of what somebody did to his life. Somebody say encouragement. We need people in our lives that will encourage us. The happiest people are those who have invested their time in others. The unhappiest people are those who wonder how the world is going to make them happy. I'm going to say that again. The happiest people are those who have invested their time in others. Ask yourself, whose life are you investing time in? Really, whose life? Is it always about you? Carl Menninger, the great psychiatrist, was asked what a lonely, unhappy person should do. And he said, lock the door behind you. Go across the street. Find someone who is hurting and help them. Forget about yourself and help others. Number two. Somebody say number two. Five ways you want others to treat you. Number two, you want others to appreciate you. Somebody say, I want people to appreciate me. Think about it. you live with people that don't appreciate you. No matter what you do, they don't appreciate what you do. No matter, no matter what you do, it's not appreciated. You know how, you know how messed up that is? To live with somebody who never says a kind word to you. Don't show you no appreciation. Never. Never says anything to encourage you and never says anything that they appreciate you. Why would you want to be around people like that? The reason the church can't grow is sometimes we got people around us that are not people, pe that are not people persons. They're melancholy. They're not sanguine. They're, they don't have the kind of outgoing personality. They, they, they can be the type of people that attack others without any, any just cause. So I want somebody to appreciate me. Look at John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. William James said, the deepest principle in a human nature is the craving to be appreciated. The deepest principle in a human nature being is the craving. I crave to be appreciated. Have you heard the story about the young politician's first campaign speech? He was very eager to make an impression on his audience, but when he arrived at the auditorium, he found only one man sitting there. He waited, hoping more people would show up, but none did. Finally, he said to the one man in the audience, look, I'm just a young politician starting out. Do you think I ought to deliver this speech or dismiss the meeting? The man thought for a moment and replied, sir, I'm just a cowhand. All I know is cows. Of course, I do know that if I took a load of hay down to the pasture and only one cow came up, I feed it. What's the principle? We cannot underestimate the value of a single person. Just because the chairs are empty, I can't come here and not have anything to say. Just because I don't have the, the audience that I think I should have, it should make me study or prepare any less. We should value the one person. With the advice from the cowhand, watch this. The politician began his speech and talked on and on and on to this one cowhand for two hours. The cowhand caller said expressionless. 
Finally, he stopped and asked the cowhand if this speech was all right. The man said, sir, I'm just a cowhand. All I know is cows. Of course, I do know if I took a load of hay down to the pasture and only one cow showed up, I surely wouldn't dump the whole load of hay on him. Principle, don't take advantage of people. J.C. Stoll, after anal analyzing many surveys, found that the principal causes of unrest among workers were the following. Failure to give credit for suggestions. Failure to give correct grievances or failure to correct grievances. When people have legitimate grievance and you don't do anything about it, God forbid you live with somebody and you grieve by something that they do continually and they just dismiss your grievance. I'm talking about people that appreciate you. When people appreciate me, watch this, they don't dismiss my grievance. Failure to encourage. Criticizing employees in front of other people. That's something I don't do. Do you do that? Do you talk to people in a way that somehow belittles them and you do it in front of other people? Have you done that? Oh, come on. Some of you know you've had some issues with people that you've said things to the person and other people happen to be in, the, in, in your company and they happen to look at you crazy because they knew what you said wasn't, wasn't appropriate. You wouldn't want nobody to talk to you like that, so why do you talk to people that way? I'm talking about the things that, 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 that they were able to find about the principles that cause unrest among people. When you criticize people in the front of them, if you got something to say to me, say it to me. Don't tell everybody. Failure to ask people what their opinion is. And failure to inform people about their progress. And showing favoritism. Can't do that. Every single thing that I just said with failure to recognize the importance of people, we're talking about people needing to be appreciated. I try to apply that principle every time I meet a person. Within the first 30 seconds of conversation, I try to say something that shows I appreciate and affirm that person. It sets the tone of the rest of our time together. Even a quick affirmation will give people a sense of value. But watch this. Don't do it in a sense that you know you don't mean it. So we have a tendency, we have a tendency to try to catch up and, oh yeah, you know I'm I'm talking to, no, no, don't people know when you're just blowing smoke. People know when you're just when you're just trying to you're trying to gaslight them. Don't try to don't try to act like you're gonna give me two seconds of your time and you're really not giving me no time at all. And you act as if you did give me some time just because you said hi. Treat others as you want them to treat you. Treat them as if they are important. When you do that, they will respond according to the way that you per perceive them. Most of us think wonderful things about people, but they never know it. Too many of us tend to be tight-fisted with our praise. It's of no value if all you do is think it. It becomes valuable when you impart it in others. Number three, I'm talking about five ways to make this church grow. Five ways that you want others to treat you. You want others to forgive you. Somebody said, I want people to forgive me. Come on now, you want to be forgiven. You imagine living with somebody who don't forgive you? You know what that's like? You know it's like living around somebody who don't forgive you. It's like you're the enemy. It's like you're always facing the enemy. They won't let you go on whatever it is that you did. Almost all emotional problems, Sister Deborah, and stress comes from unresolved conflicts. You hear me, Chris? All the stress comes from unresolved conflicts and failure to have developed right relationships with people. Because of this, many people have a deep desire for total forgiveness. Somebody say total forgiveness. A forgiving spirit is one basic necessary ingredient for a solid relationship. Forgiveness frees us from guilt and allows us to interact positively with others. 
Ernest Hemingway in his short story, The Capital of the World, tells a story about a father and his teenage son who lived in Spain. Their relationship became strained, eventually shattered. The son ran away from home. You got to hear this. The father began a long journey to search for the lost and rebellious son, finally put an ad in a Madrid newspaper as a last resort. His son's name was Paco, a very common name in Spain. The ad simply read, Dear Paco, meet me in front of the Madrid newspaper office tomorrow at noon. All is forgiven. I love you. As Hemingway writes, the next day at noon in front of the newspaper office, there were about 800 Pacos, all seeking forgiveness. And there are countless, countless Pacos in our world who want more than anything else but to be forgiven. The two great marks of a Christian are that they are giving and forgiving. We got some people call it they like to give, but they don't like to forgive. You hear me? It's easy for them to give. They can give easy because they, they have abundance. So giving, don't, giving doesn't hurt them, you know. But what hurts them is to say they made a mistake or to let somebody go. They just can't seem to forgive people. And if that's you, you, you need to get on your knees and ask God to help you adjust your attitude. Because the Bible tells us clearly, if you don't forgive others, God cannot forgive you. I'll show it to you. Look at, look at Matthew 6 and 15. How can you walk around being mad at people, mad at kids and mad at cousins and mad at other people, and they don't even know you're mad at them? You ever had people like that mad at you or you had family members mad at folk? All for what? something was said feelings were hurt and there was no resolution and no forgiveness look what it says but if you forgive not men their trespasses neither will your father forgive your trespasses give it to me in the in the message bible please son hear me out there if you refuse to do your part you cut yourself off from god's part you got a part to play You can't hold people hostage. Show me a person, Deborah, who walks with God, and I'll show you a person who has a giving heart and is forgiving of others. The unfortunate truth is that many of us, instead of offering total forgiveness, I said total forgiveness, we pray sometimes like the Irish prayer. You ever hear the Irish prayer call? Listen to the Irish prayer. May those who love us, love us. And those who don't love us, may God turn their hearts. And if he doesn't turn their hearts, may he turn their ankles. So we'll never know them by their limping. Oh, so, I'm sorry. So we'll know them by their limping. You hear that? That's the Irish prayer. May those who love us, love us. And those who don't love us, may God turn their hearts. And if he doesn't turn their hearts, may he turn their ankles. So we'll know them by their limping. People who find it difficult to forgive others don't see themselves realistically. I'm going to say it again. People that struggle with forgiveness, they have a skewed perception of their own life. Sometimes they see themselves in an unrealistic posture. Sometimes they, they live this victim, this victim mentality. Everybody's against them. And so the enemy has deceived them to thinking that the position that they hold about somebody offending them this some 10, 10, 15 years ago, they still hold on to that. The truth is people who do not forgive are hurting themselves much more than they're hurting others. A person who possesses this characteristic and keeps score in relationships is a person who is emotionally wired to carry all the stress that goes with carrying grudges. A few weeks ago, I met a man with a devastating background. His father had suffered a stroke and his mother had been in a serious accident. Both are now unable to respond to him in any way. There are areas in this man's life in which he needs and wants his parents' forgiveness. But because they are physically unable to communicate, he cannot be sure that they understand him. Every day he goes to the hospital, he asks his parents for forgiveness, but he gets no response. 
the situation is robbing him of any joy. The same man has an older brother that he hasn't spoken to in over two years. It is basically the older brother's fault. And my friend wants his brother to take the first step in patching up the relationship. I challenge my friend to let God clean his heart concerning the relationship with his parents and go ahead and take the first step in making the relationship with his brother right. The following Sunday, my friend approached me after the service and didn't say a word but gave me a great big hug. I knew what had happened and said, you made the relationship right, didn't you? Yeah, I got it taken care of, he replied. The freedom from his burden it was evident in his smile. Too often people wait too long to forgive other people. Forgiveness should be given as quickly and as totally as, as you possibly can do it. And you've got to do it now. You can't wait. Don't be in the position of a young man who is no longer ha having the opportunity to communicate with his parents because they can't talk. There's so many people, the parents have died, and they wish they could say they're sorry. Can't do it. And people carry that weight, that guilt. One of the most striking scenes of the 70s was Herbert Humphrey's funeral, seated next to Herbert, beloved wife was the former president, Richard Nixon, a longtime political adversary of Humphrey, and a man disgraced by Watergate. Humphrey himself had asked Nixon to have that place of honor. Three days before Senator Humphrey died, Jesse Jackson visited him in the hospital, and Humphrey told Jackson that he had just called Nixon. Reverend Jackson, knowing their past relationship, asked Humphrey why. Here's what Humphrey told him. He said, from this vantage point, with the sun setting in my life, all the speeches and political conventions, the crowd, the great fights are behind me. At a time like this, you're forced to deal with your irreducible essence, forced to grapple with that which is real and important. And what I've concluded about life is that when all is said and done, we must forgive each other, redeem each other, and then move on. Somebody said, forgive each other. Somebody said, redeem, and then move on. Do you know how to die victoriously? Quiet. Do you know how to die victoriously? That's the question. You got to quit keeping score of the injustices that have happened to you. If you're at odds with anyone, take the first step, confront the problem, and ask for forgiveness. Years I've been in ministry, there have been hundreds of times when I've experienced strained relationships. I had had, I've had people swear at me, tell me where to go, how to get there, and offer their assistance. But I've never normally let them walk out the door without telling them I love them. I normally tell that to everybody that, that's either here or have left here. I don't hold any grudges or carry in resentment against you or anybody. I cannot stress this enough. If you don't have peace, it isn't because someone took it from you. You gave it away. You cannot always control what happens to you, but you can control what happens in you. Number four, five ways you want others to treat you. You want others to listen to you. You want people to listen to you. One day I went to a donut shop to get a drink. A man was sitting there talking to a girl behind the counter, recognizing me, he said, was talking to this young lady. She had been listening all morning, telling him her his story. Then I realized how important it was for him that she was listening attentively and showed interest in what he had said. It made him feel he had value. When we listen to people, it makes them feel valuable. When you give people time and you give attentiveness to what they're saying, it creates and stimulates their heart, their mind. Listen to this crazy interaction between a, an indifferent husband and an attentive wife. Wife, the plumber didn't come to fix the leak behind the water heater today. Husband, uh-huh. Wife, the pipe burst today and flooded the basement. Husband, quiet. It's third down and gold to go. Wife, some of the wiring got wet and almost electrocuted fluffy. Husband, darn it, touchdown. Wife, the vet says he'll be better in a week. Husband, can you get me a Coke? Wife, the plumber told me that he was happy that our pipes broke because now he can afford to go on a vacation. Husband, aren't you listening? I said, go get me a Coke. Wife, 
And Stanley and I'm leaving you. Stanley, I'm leaving you. The plumber and I are flying to Acapulco in the morning with your money. Husband, can't you please stop all that yakking and get me a Coke? The trouble around here is nobody's ever listening to me. Some people have been living with folk for years. And the people that they've been living with have not been listening to them. How is it that somebody's been complaining to you for years and you've never considered their complaint as legitimate until they walked out on you? You cannot, listen, when somebody's expressing their heart to you about how they feel and you just completely discard it, it's like the worst thing in the world. How could you be a Christian? How could you be a friend? And you want people to listen to your nonsense, but you won't listen to other people. Number five. I'm almost done. We're going to be finished early. Number five. Number five. You want others to understand you. Why am I this way? How did I get like this? How'd you get that way? Had a bad relationship. Had an abusive husband. How'd you get like that? Had a neglectful husband. Had a wife that didn't respect me. Had a wife that never, never entreated me. I had a husband who never encouraged me. How'd you get like that? How'd you become so needy? Well, I was around my family and they always said bad things about me. Well, every time I say to you, beautiful, you keep needy, I need to keep saying it because I'm needy. Needy people often hurt folk. They're hurt. They have not been healed. And even needy people need folk to understand them. They don't need people to criticize them. They, they're that way because they lack something. Sometimes people are mean as rattlesnakes because they lack something. She's mean like that because there was abuse a long time ago that they never got over. How do you feel when you're misunderstood? What kind of feelings well up inside you? Loneliness, frustration, disappointment, resentment. These are the common feelings when we have been misunderstood. Peter Drucker, often called the father of American management, claims that 60% of all management problems are the result of faulty communications. A leading marriage counselor says that at least half of all divorces result from faulty communication between spouses. And criminologists tell us that upwards of 90% of all criminals have difficulty communicating with other people. So communication is fundamental to understanding. Let's capsulize what we've covered in these last four points. You want others to do what? Encourage you. Somebody say encourage me. Say I want somebody to appreciate me. I mean, why would you want to be in a relationship with somebody who don't appreciate you? Why would you want to be in a relationship with somebody that won't encourage you? Trying hard to be a good man, trying hard to be a good woman, but nobody encourages you. You want people to forgive you because you're not perfect. You want people to listen to you. You want people to understand you. And as you think about these qualities, consider how they apply to your own life. Perhaps this short course in human relations can help each of us develop qualities that we admire in others. The least important word, I, gets the least amount done. The most important word, we, gets the most amount done, relationships. The two most important words, thank you and appreciation. The three most important words, all is forgiven and forgiveness. The four most important words, what is your opinion in listening? The five most important words, you did a good job and understanding. In life, you are either going to see people as your adversaries or your assets. How can you be in a church and not like the women in the church that's with you? Instead of them being your sisters, you see them as adversaries. Now, you don't say that when you see them in the morning. You say, hi, good morning. But in truth, you don't love them. You feel that they're, that, that, that they're competition. I'll say this again. In life, 
You're either going to see people as adversaries or as assets. If they're adversaries, you'll be continually sparring with them. Who you spar with? Try to defend your position. If you see people as assets, you'll help them see their potential. You'll become allies in making the most of each other. The happiest day in our life will be the day when you realize we really is the most important word in the English language. We. Not me. Not I. But we. I want to see this church grow. It will not grow by itself, not just in and of itself. There has to be the, 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 the kind of vibrancy and, and character here that, that people are attracted to. They're not just attracted to because you, you made them feel good for two seconds. Sometimes we can be too busy, and people know that you're not giving them quality time. You can't be everything to everybody, and you've got to tell people that. You can't, you can't spread yourself so thin that nobody really gets a good piece of you. Am I making any sense up here? How do you feel when you're misunderstood? What kind of feelings well up inside you? I want to see us grow, and I believe that we will grow. Take some practical principles, apply them to our lives, examine our lives. Ask yourself, are people attracted to me? Are people repelled by my person? Are people drawn to me? Or people don't want to be around me? How is it that people don't want to be around you when you've got a quarter to fulfill? Christ expects you to to be an instrument in his hand to see people saved, to see his church become spotless, to see his bride become without blemishes. He's looking for us to participate in an effective, meaningful way, and that can't take place without growth. And growth, real growth, can't take place with us, without us us examining ourselves and whether or not we, we're the kind of people that other people want to be around. I don't think you can be a ministry and not be a people's person. Father, we pray right now in the name of Jesus for those that are with us, that have walked with us, that have served with us, but are challenged in their relationship with others. Some are extroverted, some are introverted, but at some time, God, we have to come out of the, our little box and we got to treat people the way we want to be treated. Spirit of the living God, break every yoke, lift every burden. Expose the lie and the excuse that we often make as it relates to, to the fact that we're living in a place called unforgiveness. Anytime we have issues with people and they have been protracted for years, it tells us that there's something wrong with our love walk. Help us see ourselves today. Spirit of God, we can't do it without you. We need you to shine a light on us so we don't be like that person that had one talent, buried what you gave him, and complained that he did work, but he really didn't. We thank you for your word tonight. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. Come on and clap your hands for the Lord if you love him. We're going to take up an offering tonight. People person. People ought to like you. Shouldn't have folks saying they don't like you. Should, that, shouldn't be, that shouldn't be a part of your testimony. You know the Bible says, sure what? It said that not only should we have a good report with God, but we ought to have a good report with people. Ask yourself tonight, will people give a good report about you? Do they say you're loving or they, do they say that you're you're like a rattlesnake. You'll bite them and cut them up. Some folk, some folk are so indifferent and, and 
so indifferent to other people's feelings. They'll cut you and don't even know it. They've been cutting people for years because they've been hurt. Father, we pray for all those that have been hurt and can't identify the hurt that caused them to keep hurting others. We pray for healing and deliverance right now in the name of Jesus. And we come against this spirit of victimization that I'm always the victim. Devil, you a liar. And I thank you for increase tonight in every area of this church, every area of our lives. For eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, not have entered in the heart the thing that you prepared for them that love you. And we give you thanks in the master's name of Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. Come on and clap them hands if you love him. If you had a chance to give, we're giving now. If you're giving online, just follow the prompts. You can mail your offering into uh, 1321 Providence Road in Brandon, Florida, 33511. New Life Christian Fellowship. Come out on Sunday. Invite somebody. We had a few visitors here. We want to see this place packed out every Sunday this year. We want to see Bible study. And it starts because people are following you because there's an attractiveness, there's an anointing on you. People just want to be around you because you're so much fun to be with. There's a balm that you carry. You're healing people. You're giving hope where there's been hopelessness. Father, thank you for giving us the resources that we can give back seed to the sower. Thank you for blessing us now, God. Give back seed to the sower and bread to the eater. We give you thanks. In the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, stand for the benediction. I'm hearing an old song. I often wonder, this is my soul, my Jesus. How great thou art, how great thou art. Yeah. I'm thinking, I'm thinking I'm hearing that. It's a song you sing, but that might not be it, but it hit me. Amen. Hallelujah. Listen, hit like and share. Hit like and share. We thank you. Come out on Sunday. Father, we give you thanks tonight for teaching us, for edifying us. Thank you for telling us what qualities we need to have to attract other people. We need to be better listeners. We need to stop thinking about ourselves and start encouraging others. Thank you, Lord, for giving me the spirit of encouragement. Thank you, Father, that I have been forgiven and I walk in forgiveness. Thank you, you taught me tonight that people that give also forgive. Thank you tonight, dear God, that you've always listened to me. You never made my issues trivial always been of the utmost important to you. Now, have your way in our lives in this church. We decree and declare growth in every facet, every area, in the children's department, in the praise team, in the worship department. We decree growth on the usher board. We decree growth in the ministerial department. We decree growth in administration, in the women's department, in every aspect of this church. Arts and crafts, in technology and in taping and production and marketing, we decree increase. Now unto him who's able to keep each of us from falling. He alone has the power to present each of us faultless in the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, to him be majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore. And may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit remind you that God wants you to be a people person. And even if you're, even if you're melancholy, God will give you the ability Alter your character so that you can win people for him. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. We love you. Come and see us on Sunday. God bless you. Take us home. Father, I love you. Father, I love you. That's it. Father, I love you. I'll wait.